This video will be covering some sensitive topics related to CSA, so please watch this video at your own discretion. Imagine wanting to go to a place that felt safe, a place where you felt you could trust the older individuals involved, even learn from them on how to be a good witness. A place where you felt that your emotional, spiritual, and religious needs were being met. Sounds wonderful, but with continued investigations, public reports that have been made, and my own research into certain religious organizations, oftentimes things postured publicly are not exactly what is going on behind closed doors. With this being said, what if everything you thought you believed in came crashing down when you realized that things were not as they should have been? While I'm never here to demonize all forms of religious or spiritual beliefs, I do want to share how different scripture and teachings in these settings can be manipulated as well as a culture of cover-ups can be created. I'm also interested in sharing cultic and high control group characteristics because as you may know, sometimes the lines begin to be blurred. Confusion sets in and it can be difficult to make sense of the rules a group makes. And before a person knows it, their identity is wrapped up in an unhealthy organization. Today, I'll be talking about the religious organization, Jehovah's Witnesses. I'll be sharing the history behind this organization, some of the beliefs, and a culture of cover-ups that finally came to light in the past several years. I'm about to get into it, so stay tuned. Welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel. I'm Rachel Ann, I'm a licensed therapist and I make videos on all things psychological commentary of current events, anti-MLM, anti-scam, and I have a very particular interest in cultic groups and high control group behaviors. If this sounds like something that you're into, feel free to subscribe so you don't miss any future videos. Before I get into the video today, I wanna to share something with you that's a little on the fun side. I have spent the last several weeks creating some mental health inspired merchandise and that can be found at my spring store, which will be linked down in the description below. If you would like to support the channel and also receive a tangible good, this is a great way to do it. And every item is mental health inspired. In addition to this, in my quest to continue to provide mental health awareness, I will be donating a dollar from every sale to an organization that provides support to communities and families. And moving into the start of this video, I do want to make it known by making this video, I am not saying that everyone involved in this organization has participated in some of these practices or hurt other people and encourage all people watching to engage in your own form of critical thinking and make decisions that feel really healthy for you. All right, let's get into the video. First, it's always important to get to know what an organization is all about. So I'll start with some of the beliefs that are very specific to the Jehovah's Witnesses organization. Jehovah's Witnesses is a religious sect that was founded in the 1870s by Charles Taze Russell. However, the name Jehovah's Witnesses wasn't adopted until about 1931 to create a separation and distance from traditional Christian groups. With that being said, we've got our first red flag. There is the distancing of this group from anyone else. As you can imagine, this does go into creating an us versus them mentality, but we'll get more into that in just a few minutes. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that ultimately a person's guidance comes through something they call the Watchtower Society, which is also the religion's legal entity. Per various articles on this religious organization, I did see a common statement made that they consider the Watchtower Society to be the only true way and encourage all believers to fully submit to it. Men are elected as leaders of the organization and ultimately hold spiritual authority over the followers. Jehovah's Witnesses are encouraged to look to the society as their authority, further posturing that the Jehovah's Organization is ultimately ruled by God and to disagree with what the Watchtower Society says ultimately means that a follower is disagreeing with God. 
the Watchtower Society also at times makes claims that it alone can reveal the true meaning of the Bible. And to be a Jehovah's Witness means that you deny the doctrine of the Trinity, which is essentially a pillar and a central belief of the Christian faith. Their claim is that Jesus is not God, and they consider the Holy Spirit to be an invisible yet active force from Jehovah. In addition to this, Jehovah's Witnesses use a biblical translation called the New World Translation, which according to TowerWatch.com is, quote, the New World Translation of the Bible is Jehovah's Witnesses' own translation. No other religious group uses this Bible, and Jehovah's Witnesses make very little use of other Bibles, end quote. Some of the other notable beliefs of this religious organization is that Jehovah's Witnesses are taught to believe that the entire world system, which includes social, political, military, and even other religions, are under the control of the devil. Members are encouraged and actually rather commanded to be separate from it. This is why members do not participate in or celebrate birthdays, religious holidays such as Easter or Christmas, or any patriotic holidays such as President's Day or Memorial Day. According to the Jehovah's Witnesses website, their explanation regarding rejection of celebrating these holidays is because, quote, we believe that such celebrations displease God, end quote. There are other reasons listed that birthday celebrations have pagan roots and they support a belief that on a person's birthday, it was said that evil spirits and influencers had the opportunity to attack the celebrants. They also state that birthday records coincide with the casting of horoscopes, which is based upon astrology and that is strictly condemned and forbidden. Their website further states that early Christians did not celebrate birthdays. The Bible never refers to a servant of God celebrating a birthday, which I might add that this is going to be the start of how convenient it is that this religious organization has actually created their own translation of the Bible. It does make it all the more easier to justify many of these rules that they have in place. Notably, Jehovah's Witnesses are also forbidden from becoming involved in politics, which includes voting, saluting the flag, or holding office in a position in government, as well as engaging in military service. There has also been much controversy on this next particular stipulation of this organization. In 1945, the Watchtower Society got together and decided to ban its members from accepting any form of blood. There has been contradictions and teachings on this issue since, but many people have passed away as a result of being forbidden to have blood transfusions due to being a practicing Jehovah's Witness. Last but not least, to continue to give a picture on some of the organization's beliefs, at this somewhat cursory level because it would be difficult to go fully into every aspect of the doctrine, but witnesses are often forbidden to socialize outside of the organization and it was very much published across the board in many different articles that receiving any kind of higher education is often discouraged and any questioning of their doctrine is considered an offense high enough to be disfellowshipped, which is another word they use for basically being excommunicated from the church or shunned. It's been said from many survivors who have now come forward after leaving that if you choose to leave this organization, then you often lose everything. Friends, family, connections within the church, maybe even livelihood in some cases. Let's move on to some research I found by the Pew Research Center who conducted a religious landscape study. You know I love my research and it should be noted that this research was published in 2016, but because it was so comprehensive, I definitely wanted to include it in this video. The Pew Research Center found that Jehovah's Witnesses are among the most racially and ethnically diverse religious groups in the United States. They also found that compared with other religious groups in the US, that Jehovah's Witnesses tend to be less educated. And more than half at 63% had no more than a high school diploma. Also compared to other religious groups within the US, Jehovah's Witnesses actually were found to have a low retention rate in their religious group. 
Among all United States adults raised as Jehovah's Witnesses, two-thirds, so 66%, no longer identify with the group. But notably, about two-thirds of current Jehovah's Witnesses are converts, meaning they were raised in a different faith and then joined the Jehovah's Witnesses sect as an adult. Think Prince. When we think about indoctrination and cultic groups identifying their belief systems as the one true way, research performed by Pew Center tells us that 83% of Jehovah's Witnesses say their religion is the one true faith, leading to eternal life, where as in comparison, only about three in 10 United States Christians, so 29%, believe this about their own faith. In terms of time control or spending time in their faith, in comparison with U.S. Christians overall, it was found that 85% of Jehovah's Witnesses are especially likely to say they attend religious services at least once a week, 90% say they pray daily, and 76% say they share their faith with others at least once per week. This shouldn't be too surprising as part of being a Jehovah's Witness is to engage in practices of ministering by handing out tracts or knocking on doors or witnessing to anyone in your immediate proximity. As the responsibility is placed on followers that they are essentially responsible for where other people go after they die. There are videos of one of the higher ups saying that blood is essentially on the members' hands if they fail to be a witness. Pew Research Center also published another research-based article in 2021 that shared that 41 countries had banned at least one religion-related group in 2019. And Jehovah's Witnesses in Baha'is, not sure if I'm saying that correctly, were among the most frequently banned groups. According to this article, Jehovah's Witnesses were banned in eight countries spanning the Asia Pacific region, Europe, and the Middle East North Africa region. In Russia, there was a 2017 decision by the nation's Supreme Court who banned Jehovah's Witnesses and criminalized their activities as being, quote, extremist, end quote. In addition to being labeled as an extremist group, Brunei also labeled Jehovah's Witnesses as, quote, deviant, end quote. You may be wondering how and why this religious organization has been labeled with these terms. One important facet of Jehovah's Witnesses is a fairly persistent warning of an impending Armageddon. The ever-present theme that the world will end is often used as a way to control members' behaviors by encouraging participation in ministering and attending kingdom halls. One former member who left the group and actually created a film titled Apostasy shared his experience of doubting and then deciding to leave the group, stating, quote, It was a very slow process. The first thing I noticed was that I didn't feel comfortable with the way women were treated. It might have been a wedding ceremony, all the scriptures they were pulling out about women needing to be capable wives and men being the head of the house. They were using lots of disturbing phrases, end quote. He then shares, quote, then I went to college and that was the key really. People would ask my opinion on something and I would be scrambling around trying to find an answer in a text somewhere because that's what life as a witness is like. It's group thinking based on the interpretation of a text, end quote. Based upon his statements, this is very reminiscent of Stephen Hassan's concept of information control that is often in place for high control groups as part of the BITE model. Control the information that members are allowed to see, use fear to tell members that if they go outside a permitted doctrine, they are sinning, and it is the perfect recipe to maintain control. Another former member who left Jehovah's Witnesses and ended up writing her book entitled Leaving the Witness, Exiting a Religion, and Finding a Life shared that she was a third generation Jehovah's Witness and the belief system dictated that she was not to receive college education, but was instead supposed to devote her time to trying to convert people to her faith. This woman also shared that she was taught the apocalypse was imminent and indoctrinated with the belief that only the people who devote themselves to the Jehovah's Witness faith 
would be saved. Restricting education, especially for women, is, as you can imagine, another excellent way to maintain control. Knowledge is power, and education allows one to engage in critical thinking, whereas if a person is only permitted to read the Watchtower literature or not socialize or associate with other people outside of the religion, their map of reality becomes set on the particular beliefs of the high control group. Then, if a member goes outside the core rules of the group in the Jehovah's Witness religion, they are asked to confess to a panel of elders who then decide the member's fate. If the member is deemed to not be faithful enough or to have engaged in a grievance that is catastrophic enough, then the member is disfellowshipped, which, as I shared earlier, means they are essentially excommunicated and other members of the congregation are no longer allowed to speak to them or acknowledge them if they see the person in public. The former member is shunned. This is a scary thought for a member because the more immersed that a person becomes in a religion or any group really, their whole social network, their whole support system can be the other members of the high control group. And to lose this can be extremely devastating. Not to mention disorienting as the former member must pretty much start over. This practice of disfellowshipping and the ever-present threat of being removed from the group for disobedience also goes into maintaining control. In addition to creating the us versus them mentality where you're either for the group or against them, there's really no in-between. I wanna go ahead and issue a really heavy trigger warning for this next section as I'm going to be sharing some information regarding cover-ups of CSA. Over the past several years, there have been many ex exposés and documentaries written about a secret database of thousands of Jehovah's Witness child SOs that have been documented and consequently were found to have been sealed by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Per an article by the Daily Beast, this list was created on March 14th, 1997 after other whistleblowers have come forward and a questionnaire had been sent to 10,000 nationwide congregations, surveying them on whether or not they were aware of CSA within the congregation. It's been reported that the church received ample information on perpetrators of CSA. A Jehovah's Witness in the Watchtower Society spokesperson stated that they, quote, comply with CA reporting laws, even if there is only one witness, end quote. However, there have been many people who have come forward to state otherwise, and in 2020, there was a group of at least 20 former Jehovah's Witnesses who engaged in a lawsuit regarding incidents of SA. When these brave individuals decided to come forward, a harmful and silencing rule put in place by the Jehovah's Witnesses organization came to light quite publicly. This rule is called the two witness rule, which essentially blocks any formalized reporting of CSA to necessary authorities, such as police or child protective services. Per an article on the Zalkin Law Firm website who specializes in representing survivors of this organization, the two witness rule is the practice based on the claim that there is a biblical interpretation of how to handle CSA. And this claim per the Jehovah's Witnesses organization states that any allegations of CSA must be corroborated with a second witness to the act. Obviously, this is extremely problematic in that typically CSA occurs behind closed doors where other people would not be witnessing the act. There's also often high levels of manipulation that occur too, where the child is encouraged to keep the horrific act secret and or is shamed slash fear is instilled that if the child speaks out, there will be severe ramifications. In the event that a second witness does come forward, then allegations are discussed with the elders of the church at what is called a judicial committee. Then the elders are given the power and responsibility to squash the concerns, or if they address them, then there were reports that the alleged perpetrator may not be allowed to attend church for a couple months, maybe a year, but then are often welcomed back into the organization without any form of legal ramifications. As you can see, everything is kept 
in-house and dealt with by a group of elders who are given an immense amount of power. We all have seen time and time what happens when corrupt leaders are in place. Horrific acts of abuse can be kept secret, all for the image that the group wishes to continue to uphold. It's always extremely fascinating to me that these high control groups list so much information on their websites. They often list their teachings, and I find it interesting that if you really get into the doctrine and read it, the problems are so readily evident. The first red flag I saw was that there is a plethora of information on preventing CSA. Some titles include, Your Child is in Danger, Consoling Adult Survivors of Childhood Trauma, How Can We Protect Our Children, and lastly, What to Do If Your Child Is, capital A. In the article entitled, Your Child is in Danger, the group points out that there's been a global outcry that has arisen over the CSA of children. Yet they only cite that there are celebrities who have publicly disclosed their own experiences. They don't share in this article anything about how they too have a long and sordid history of covering up the same acts. Strangely, this article then goes on to say that CSA is an ancient problem and they share Bible verses and history of how this, quote, moral depravity has been around for over 4,000 years. They even go on to cite rather graphic details of what happened in ancient Greece and Rome to girls. I find this to be very unsettling because in a strange way, it almost normalizes that CSA is a problem that's been around for years and years. And an individual who is a perpetrator of CSA may even read that and justify his or her own actions. In another article entitled, If Your Child Is A, they do give telltale signs that CSA has occurred, but then they also state that, quote, some legal experts advise reporting the A to authorities as soon as possible. In some lands, the legal system may require this, but in other places, the legal system may offer little hope of successful prosecution, end quote. There's no clear directive here that if this happens, you are to report it. Instead, it's almost discouraged by discussing how there is often little hope of prosecution and it may not be required in, quote, some lands, end quote. I find it to be a very manipulative way of responding to CSA. As a mandated reporter, let me go ahead and just share that if there is ever a hint of concern, that you're always allowed to, in good faith, make a report to your local Child Protective Services Agency, contact the police, or take the child to the nearest local emergency department for an examination. There is another article entitled Prevention in the Home. This article states repeatedly that CSA is often perpetrated by a member of the family. In many ways, this is an accurate statement, yet the Jehovah's Witnesses organization states that, quote, anyone who essays a child risks being disfellowshipped, put out of the congregation, end quote. There's no mention that a person also risks being imprisoned, and I can only wonder why wouldn't they mention that there? So the person can be disfellowshipped and put out of the congregation, but there's no mention of reporting to authorities. The question arises, why would a religious organization have a multitude of articles on CSA? It's one thing to list warning signs and the church's stance on CSA, even clearly stating that it will immediately be reported. But none of these articles state that legal action will take place. Instead, there are quotes of scripture on how wrong it is, as well as providing a rather lengthy historical viewpoint on how CSA has been around for 4,000 years. In my research of continued doctrine that is being taught by the Jehovah's Witnesses organization, I did want to pull up a couple quick brief articles on relationships, marriage, as well as a personality article on the importance of being what they call mild. So we'll start with that one first. The article is entitled Mildness, How Does It Benefit Us? And they give the example of a young woman named Sarah talking about how she's a timid person by nature and that when she meets people who are really what they call aggressive or strong-minded, it makes her feel uncomfortable. 
the JW.org website states that mildness is an inner peaceful disposition. A mild person deals with others in a gentle, kind way and is able to face life's irritations with calmness and self-control. That is not always a bad thing to face life's irritations with a sense of self-control. However, things start to take a turn when this particular attribute is encouraged to be basically upheld at all cost. And so they list reasons that mildness is a quality that attracts people. Mildness protects us as well as those around us. If we are mild, we do not quickly get frustrated or react angrily. We, we thus avoid feelings of guilt that arise after we hurt someone, especially a person whom we love. And mildness protects those around us from suffering because of our unrestrained spirit. Mildness in and of itself is not a negative quality. However, in these religious groups that fall under being high control, this encouragement to be mild at all costs can be a great way to try to control members' emotions. That any fluctuation from a state of being demure, meek, and mild in spirit is seen as not being obedient it's seen as causing issues and it can be discouraged when human beings naturally have a range of emotions. And if you're feeling angry about something, it may be tied to a very good reason that needs further exploration. But if you're always being in this robotic, mild state and you're encouraged to tamp down those other emotions, then it can prevent you from one, being who you really are. Maybe your personality is to be louder and more assertive, maybe even strong-willed, but through this doctrine, it can tell you that those are not good qualities. And so you can get away from who you truly are, but it also can cause other members to look down upon you for reacting as a quote unquote normal human would over different situations. They then give the examples that to be mild is really to be like Jesus. And it says, Jesus was humble at heart. This next sentence says, humility helps us to avoid taking ourselves too seriously or becoming overly sensitive. Okay, humility can absolutely help us to avoid taking ourselves too seriously. I, I agree with that to a certain extent. However, the second part is, or becoming overly sensitive, and it goes on to say, how did Jesus respond to those who unjustly criticized him for being a glutton and given to drinking wine? He let his examples stifle the criticism, and he mildly pointed out that wisdom is proved righteous by its works. As you may know, in high control groups, they almost prep the members to be prepared for naysayers. And this to me is another great way of weaving in that manipulative language that if others criticize you, part of being a good Jehovah's Witness is to just take it and to remain so humble. And I think that this encouragement to be mild can in some ways further stilt any form of critical thinking. Because if you're not supposed to respond or if you are supposed to have wisdom that is proved by being righteous in your works, then you're constantly being deterred from reacting. Not to mention when other people criticize a group and there is a multitude of other people that have criticized a group, it is only natural to take pause and start looking at the group you're a part of or experience some form of cognitive dissonance where you're questioning what your beliefs are, but the other actions of other people are not aligning or whatever the case could be. There's a lot of different examples when it comes to experiencing cognitive dissonance. But right here, it's to me also setting people up to be prepared that other people are going to unjustly criticize you. And this could mean criticize the practice of being a Jehovah's Witness, but your role and responsibility is to 
essentially maintain unwavering compliance to being a Jehovah's Witness. Or instead of identifying or advocating for yourself if you do receive an act of injustice, to remain mild at all costs, which we know can really be detrimental to a person in terms of not being able to fully express their emotions. So then it says Jesus left matters in God's hands. Jesus accepted unjust treatment while he was on earth. He was misunderstood, despised, and tortured. Even so, he remained mild-tempered because he, quote, entrusted himself to the one who judges righteously, end quote. It says here that Jesus knew that his heavenly father would care for him and deal with the injustices at the right time. So it's almost discouraging taking human action on injustices that may be occurring to an individual in this organization. If you have a religious background, then you know that part of having a sense of faith is trusting that God will handle things in his own time. However, the issue presents itself in these high control groups when this sense of faith is twisted and it's used to instill fear in members or maintain control to discourage them from taking action or even in some cases potentially reporting things. There is a lot of talk, a lot of articles, many survivors have come forward to talk about the roles that men and women have in this organization. So I wanna quickly tap into an article called Look to God for a Happy Marriage. And there is some information that to create a happy marriage, the first step is to accept the role Jehovah gave you. It says, if you are a husband, Jehovah expects you to care for your wife tenderly. He made her as a compliment of you. If you have watched previous videos of mine, I have tapped in slightly to complementarianism and how it has been widely criticized as a practice of these fundamentalist groups and high control groups. So I'm not gonna get too much into that today, but I will link an article down below that you may find helpful if you wanna read more up on that. So we go on to see that if you are a wife, Jehovah expects you to respect your husband deeply and to help him fulfill his role. So I clicked on 1 Corinthians 11, 3 that they have here, and it says, but I want you to know that the head of every man is the Christ. In turn, the head of a woman is the man. In turn, the head of the Christ is God. And granted, this is their translation that I am reading, but right there, it basically has the same structure that other high control religious groups have, such as IBLP, where there is that umbrella of authority type mentality where essentially Christ is at the head, Christ is over everyone, then comes the man, then comes the woman. Then there is a secondary Bible verse they include here. It's Ephesians 5.33. Nevertheless, each one of you must love his wife as he does himself. On the other hand, the wife should have deep respect for her husband. So lots of emphasis on having respect for the husband and the husband here is being told to treat his wife with dignity and love. Which of course, in and of itself, is not a negative thing. And this is why, again, many of these teachings can be somewhat misleading and draw a person in because who doesn't want to be in a respectful, loving relationship where each person is encouraged to treat the other person with respect and dignity. However, let's continue to break this down. But really, at the root of this, the husband is still considered the head of the household and the woman is under him. We know that this can be problematic. We know that this can set the stage for abuse of power to occur. It can just really be a detrimental teaching and doctrine by certain cultic and high control religious groups. The second tenant is to really care about your mate's feelings. Yep, okay, I mean, that can be a really good thing to care about your partner. And it says, you need to look out for the interests of your marriage mate, treat your mate as precious, remembering that Jehovah requires his servants to be gentle toward all. Thoughtless speech is like the stabs of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is, is a healing. Choose your words carefully. A Jehovah's spirit will help you to speak with kindness and love. And then we see what you can do. Pray for help to remain calm and to keep an open mind before discussing serious matters with your mate. Think carefully about what you will say and how you will say it. 
There are elements of this that I can appreciate. Uh, as a therapist, of course, I find feelings to be really important. I think that feelings can be indicators that something is not right. They can be our internal guide that we can listen to and learn from how we feel after interacting with certain people, places, and things. But I also know that in high control groups, this concept of monitoring your feelings paired with these other proverbs and verses such as thoughtless speech is like the stabs of a sword but the tongue of the wise is a healing can be very confusing because you may be having all of these emotions or your husband has done something that's really upsetting to you or in turn you know on the flip side your wife has done something that's been really upsetting to you yet you're so encouraged to be mild in spirit to Pray for this sense of calm and really think so carefully about what you're going to say before you say it that it almost makes me wonder how are people allowed to just be people. This is a common theme that comes up. Anytime I review a religious group or a new age spiritual cultic group, there is so much emphasis on the people to behave in this perfect manner when it is not realistic. And so when a person is unable to achieve perfection, then they can feel even worse about themselves because they can beat themselves up for making a mistake or for just being human, losing your temper. Let's move on to see some of the other teachings of the JW organization regarding marriage and divorce. I am pulling some of this information from an article entitled, What Does the Bible Say About Marriage? One of the first tenets is that the Jehovah's Witnesses organizations do not condone or agree with same-sex marriages. But for the sake of this video, I am going to center in on some other teachings specifically regarding divorce. It further goes on to say that in God's eyes, marriage creates a permanent bond. When a man and a woman get married, they promise to be loyal to each other and to stay together for as long as they both are alive. God expects them to keep that promise. This is actually the overarching theme in the doctrine related to the Jehovah's Witnesses organization. There are some tenets, which I'm about to get into this next one, on separation and divorce, but ultimately their preference is to, at all costs, stay with your partner, which is not too far off from other high control religious groups that really believe that once you get married, you should stay in it forever. The next heading says, what about separation and divorce? And they say there may be times when a husband and wife must be apart from each other, such as when one mate needs to travel to care for a family emergency. But the Bible discourages separation resulting from marital problems. Instead, it urges couples in such a situation to work towards reconciliation. They go on to share that adultery is the only scriptural grounds for divorce. Hence, if a husband and wife decide to separate or to divorce for any reason other than adultery, neither partner is scripturally free to date someone else or to remarry. Obviously, this is very problematic because if this belief is instilled and ingrained in a person, what happens if there is domestic violence or abuse that happens within the marriage? Per this doctrine, the only way somebody can justify getting a divorce is if adultery has occurred. This is something that could cause extreme confusion and guilt if somebody wants to be divorced from their partner, if there is abuse occurring, if the partner is even so emotionally distant that they're just existing together and it becomes a source of depression or contention within the household. I mean, there are many reasons why people get divorced and adultery according to this doctrine, is the only justifiable reason to leave when we know that there are so many other real life problems that happen that absolutely warrant a divorce, whether it's for emotional, mental, financial, or physical safety. Okay, so something else that is unsettling, and this is the tip of the iceberg. I have no doubt that if you were a member of the Jehovah's Witness 
organization that you have a lot more insight, but this is what I'm just seeing from their website. And it says, what roles and responsibilities does the Bible assign to husbands and wives? In bold, it says shared responsibilities. Okay, great. But then we go on and it says, husbands and wives should treat each other with love and respect. Okay. They should care for each other's sexual needs in a loving way and avoid all forms of unfaithfulness. It's always fascinating to me and unnerving when a religion starts to dictate how sex needs to be managed within the confines of marriage. This is where we get into shaky ground because a lot of times this doctrine that members are encouraged to follow is put in place to instill fear, especially towards women, that if you don't fulfill your husband sexually, he will commit adultery, but it'll be your fault. Now, this is not overtly stated right here, but to me, this basically implies that you should acquiesce to your partner. And this is always concerning to me when religious doctrine starts to dictate how you're supposed to behave romantically, sexually with your partner. In these high control groups, it almost becomes less about worshiping God and more about maintaining control over behaviors, especially within your interpersonal relationships. Then we get into the different roles of the the family and it says a husband's role the bible says that a husband is head of his wife he is the head in the sense that he should guide his family and make decisions that will benefit his wife and children this is par for the course i've already been over that so i'm not going to get too far into it but i just think it's interesting we go back to ephesians 5 23 because a husband is head of his wife just as the Christ is head of the congregation, he being a savior of this body. So they're basically comparing the husband to Christ in that the husband is the head of his wife, just as Christ is the head of the congregation. Again, this only can create a stage for the abuse of power to occur when a man is given all of this power over his family and the wife is expected to be submissive. So then it talks about here a wife's role and it says the Bible says that a wife should have deep respect for her husband. God is pleased when a wife respects the role that he assigned to her husband. Her role is to assist her husband, helping him to make good decisions and supporting his headship. The Bible speaks highly of a wife who fulfills her important role in marriage. The wife here is encouraged to help her husband make good decisions, yet if you read closely, she is not encouraged to make her own decisions. There are definitely high levels of encouragement for the wife to play the supporting role in her husband's life and not necessarily take leadership, that that's on the husband to be the head of the household. And it is also implied and overtly stated that this is doing God's work essentially for the wife to maintain this role of being submissive. And if we go back to the, the male's role, the husband's role, it says that he shows that he values his wife's qualities and capabilities by working closely with her and by carefully considering her opinion and feelings when making decisions. So he's instructed to consider her feelings, but ultimately he's given the power to be the one to make the decisions right in line with high control religious groups and the very, very strict and rigid gender roles that are assigned. Research shows time and time again that this strict adherence to gender roles within the confines of a relationship can actually promote abuse. It can actually promote toxic masculinity. It can promote the belief that women are not equal and therefore women are put down. It's problematic all around. This next piece I thought was very interesting. It says, does God require married couples today to have children? <laughs> and it says, no. In the past, God commanded some of his worshipers to have children, but Christians are not bound by that instruction. Jesus never commanded his father's followers to have children. This just goes into, I just wonder if back in the day, Jehovah's Witnesses did believe that to be a good Christian, you had to have children. And then this is a doctrine that has been updated with the times. So if you have ever been part of JW organization and you have more insight into this, please leave a comment because I would be very fascinated to know. 
Last but not least, what I want to cover is an article called An End to Domestic Violence. I have to point out again that it is telling that this religious organization has all of these articles on these kinds of problems. It tells me that these are common recurring issues potentially that occur within the organization and people are asking for help. This is not to say that providing information is a negative thing by any means. Knowledge is power, information is power, but when it comes to high control groups, the information is often very skewed. And so let's break down what exactly this particular article talks about. They start out by interviewing a couple, Valerie and Troy. Basically, Valerie begins discussing that on the night of their marital engagement, her spouse struck her and she had a bruise for a week. He then apologized profusely and promised he would never do it again. In the years to come, I would hear those words many times. Troy goes on to say, anything would set me off. Late meals, for instance. I'm not going to read the next part, but it says on another occasion, he ended up striking her so badly that he thought that he had ended her life. And then he tried to frighten her by including his child. This, unfortunately, is actually an, a good example of what can happen in a relationship where domestic violence is present. They're sharing all of this information, but when it comes to how they were able to get through it, this is the turning point for me. It says that Troy, who in this case, heterosexual couple, Troy was the perpetrator. It says that his wife began studying the Bible with Jehovah's Witnesses. At first, I was jealous of her new friends, and I thought I needed to save her from this strange sect. So I became even more violent, not only toward Valerie, but also toward the witnesses. I really think it's very convenient that the interweaving of the wife deciding to follow Jehovah's Witnesses is put in here. Because this was such a high control relationship, I'm actually really surprised that she was even permitted to go to these Bible studies. This is me being very picky and analytical here, but per this particular example that they give, he was so violent with her and so controlling that she really didn't have a lot of freedom. So, but of course the one freedom that she did have was to go study with Jehovah's Witnesses. I find that, that very telling. In looking at this through the lens of knowing how cultic groups put out propaganda to get members to join their organization. This very much paints the picture that JW organization has the answers to people's problems. And even though it may not be overtly stated, again, that manipulative undertone is that it was them who were able to save this couple and help them. So then he also goes on to talk about how good the, the witnesses were to him and that essentially through getting to know the witnesses, he more or less became a changed man. The one piece about this that I like on a surface level is that the man in the situation stated, if you are physically or verbally violent towards your family, admit that you need help and get it. There is plenty of help available. That's the part I like because if somebody is being violent, the first step is admitting that they have a problem and getting help. So that's important is to reach out for help. However, he then goes on to say that for him, his help and what changed him was studying the Bible with Jehovah's Witnesses and associating with them really helped him to overcome his deeply entrenched violent tendencies. So help is encouraged, but it's it's also steered that the help should come from being a part of Jehovah's Witnesses organization. Now, can you imagine if you were in an abusive relationship and you read this particular example and article, there is going to be a quick emotional identification. I mean, the example that they used was graphic, it was detailed, and unfortunately, it is something that does happen in DV relationships. So it is a great tool to get somebody to come and start visiting the group. They think, wow, so if the JW organization helped them, it could maybe help us as well. This is me just viewing the doctrine that's often put out by these high control groups. But in a lot of ways, I think that this could potentially be a hook, another hook for somebody to join this organization. Am I saying that in some ways, 
becoming religious or spiritual cannot help someone? Not at all. Because like I always spit out, research shows that religion and spirituality and having those practices can help a person fare better in life. So I'm not saying that it would fix everything, but I also don't think it would hurt everything. What I don't really care for though is the spinning of this that it's a great way to encourage people that being a part of Jehovah's Witnesses is what healed their relationship. So essentially it can also heal yours. This may be a part one to this video because there is so much more information to cover, but I wanted to go ahead and just give this brief overview for today of this particular organization. Feel free to share with me your thoughts on what was discussed. High control groups come in many different forms, but as you can see within this organization, there are those common cultic elements present. The use of fear to maintain control, the use of information control, certain restrictions, and it all goes into keeping people in this little box. And to go outside of that box means that you are a sinner. To be disobedient, you are a sinner. To ask questions, you are sinning. And you're not being like Jesus. All excellent ways to maintain control and keep people within an organization. If you like this video, then you may also enjoy some previous videos I've done on psychological commentary. So I'll link the playlist over here, or you may like the series I did on the Institute in Basic Life Principles. As always, take really good care of yourself and be well.